So um, I hope it will stop when I turn on turn off. Is uh, Roberto Giacobatti, the professor at the University of Verona, he got his PhD from the University of Pisa, both in Italy, obviously. And he is known for a lot of work both on the theory of abstract interpretation and practical applications. He has also done work on uh, security, uh, like interpretation flow and authentication. And today he will talk about how to prove the completeness of a static analysis. Okay, thank you. I will try to see if it's possible to analyze uh, how an analysis perform on code. So we will not make uh, analysis of programs, but we'll try to make an analysis of analysis. It can appear weird, of course. Usually, I quote this from Patrick's uh, old slides. And usually we have code, and we want to make analysis, so we extract invariants, properties, and, uh, well, this is for debugging the most, for very fine, because you don't trust uh, the source of the programmers, usually. So you want to discover if there is a bug, so you want to understand how it works, that code. And uh, if you clearly understand the code, then you are happy. But uh, there is another point of view in this. Is, uh, may want to make the code difficult to analyze. Why this? Well, we've seen before the talk of the colleague from ETH. He said, well, if you want to avoid some specific attacks, you may want to protect uh, the control flow graph, for instance. And there are many ways for protecting it. This is the story of obfuscation, for instance. Obfuscation is nothing else than uh, destroying the structure as much as you can in order to make uh, the code uh, completely weird in such a way that you basically are unable to see what's going on inside. But in the end, it works the same. I spent six months in this company, Canada. It's pretty weird, interesting. They build a compiler. It's completely, nobody knows if that compiler injects or not the bugs. But the point is that the code survives for a few seconds, and then it's replaced by new code that do the same thing. It contains a key, the key that is used to decrypt uh, images, for instance, in um, satellite TV network. And um, the compiler, for I tried this little Fibonacci because, of course, I studied in Pisa, so it has to be done with Fibonacci. And I compiled Fibonacci into Fibonacci. And it appears weird. The control flow graph is completely flattened, even though you see it uh, vertically. And uh, if you feed the function with the same input, you don't see the same trace uh, again. Because blocks are redundant, so the attacker tries to hack this block, but this block uh, will not be executed for the same input in another execution. And of course, uh, this uh, code becomes very weird. I try to analyze it with the program analysis and it came out uh, completely unknown uh, results. So um, everything can, can be possible, in fact. So we are in the situation, in this case, where the trusted entity, so we are not in a crypto case. In crypto case, we have the man in the middle that we want to avoid. So the communication between the two, Bob and Alice, uh, are in such a way that is protected in the middle because they trust each other. But this is not the case here. Here we have, you have, Man in the end. That means that you don't know if this guy is really Bob. And indeed can be not Bob, so can be a, a hacker that hacks your code. So you want to protect it completely in order to make it uh, obscure. So the point here is that uh, when you do debugging, you, have, um, you want to defense your code from bugs uh, and make it secure, for instance, safe, and you push the precision of your analysis high, while the attacker tries to do the inverse, tries to exploit the bug. When you do protection, you go on a different shape. 
the defense tries to avoid the reverse engineering that used analysis for extracting information from the code. So, and the attacker, of course, tries to exploit uh, that tendency. So we are in a situation where the code is generated. It's not the case where we have one important piece of program that we want to analyze and extract the most from it. But we are in a case where we diversify a lot the code. So we generate uh, different versions of the code that survive a few seconds that can be generated new ones. And this because uh, bas basically virtual black box obfuscation is impossible. So it's been proved in the year 2001. There's a fundamental paper on that. At the same time, more and more code is uh, mobile, of course. You have malware that flow in the network. And uh, you move more and more from a static, uh, an important piece of code that is feeded by many data to an important set of data that has many queries, programs, that tries to extract information from it. So we are shifting the situation in a, in a different scenario where the programs uh, are many probably too many. So the question is, how can an analysis perform on this code? Or <coughs> symmetrically, what does it mean being obscure, a code for an analysis? There is a very simple example that should clarify the, the issue. Imagine that your program is just one command that makes a multiplication. We all know that multiplication can be easily analyzed with the sign perspective by the rule of sign, which is a straightforward, basic, uh, neat uh, abstract interpretation. You abstract data, so you don't need data. You abstract data into signs, and then you, you are able, by that little table, to reconstruct completely the sign of the result. How can I make it obscure for that specific attack? Well, if I don't do multiplication, but I do addition, the sign loses the magnitude of numbers, so it's unable to reconstruct the, si the sign of the result. So if I turn that little program into this loop, that loops uh, an iteration of additions, the same analysis fails and becomes incomplete, imprecise. Okay, so this is pretty straightforward. You can look, uh, there is a book by Christian Kohlberg that has a collection of all hacking techniques for making code weird. And you see there are data obfuscation. Data obfuscation is another technique, very simple. This is another simple example. You have one variable, you split it in two. One is division by 10, the other one is a model 10. And then you reconstruct in the end the result. Okay, so you have this little program, you analyze it by intervals. You get that interval, which is precisely the interval computed inside this loop. If I change uh, the loop uh, with this uh, data obfuscation, the result is that uh, the interval I get um, gets an error. Why this? Because interval analysis is not relational. So I need a more refined domain to extract the right invariant. It's not relational, so it has to soundly approximate uh, the maximal error computed at that point, which is uh, in zero, nine, the, mod the modulo that we have. So this means that uh, this transformation obfuscates uh, interval analysis simply. You can make it even more complicated and you can, this is a little PHP program that do the same exact technique, but dynamically generate codes during its run. So if you analyze the snapshot of the memory, you will see that uh, you increase uh, linearly the error that is produced by interval analysis because you are increasing that uh, error. A ex little simple example of dynamic obfuscation. So what is this obfuscation? Obfuscation is an obscurity, so the impossibility of the analysis to extract the information that they want to. So it's imprecision. In this case, uh, and Patrick showed before, corresponds precisely to incompleteness. Incompleteness means that uh, if you compute uh, the program and you abstract the result, you get something more precise than abstract interpreting the program into the approximated object. And it's easy, very easy to prove that uh, you obfuscate in this sense, if and only if the obfuscating compiler, which is a transformer, so program transformation from P to type P, that preserves input output, 
such a way that program, the transformant program, is incomplete for the abstraction. That's an ethanol lead. So making obscure means becoming incomplete. But we played this game, and uh, we went in this book, we took a bunch of uh, abstractions. Actually, they are not specified abstractions except uh, monitoring that has been given by Patrick in Popul 2002. But the others can be easily specified as abstract interpretation. So, for instance, the attacker that tries to extract the contour flow graph is the easy abstract interpreter that ex performs the extraction of the contour flow graph. And so on. All these are abstractions. And then, uh, well, from standard compilers, uh, you know that if you specialize the interpreter with a program, you inherit uh, in the new program, this one, the programming style of the interpreter and the functionality of the program. So it's enough to change the interpreter, to twist the interpreter, and you generate an obfuscated code. Interestingly, for each of these abstractions, there is an abstract interpreter, and a twisted interpreter that performs the best for that abstraction, namely that produce in the end a program that if I analyze with that abstraction, gives me I don't know as a result. So now the question is, can we prove, possible to prove, that uh, an abstraction for a given program will not write false alarms? Because saying I don't know is the maximum amount of possible false alarms. Everything is possible in the sample. Or equivalent, can we prove that program P is not obscure for A? So the model is the standard one. You have uh, traces, so this is the semantics that behaves along the time for a variable. Want to make uh, verification or debugging, you know that if these are bug states, then this program will never write a bug, will never provide a, produce a bug. You may have false alarms when the approximation in will include uh, this. This happened because of soundness, and soundness is specified by this equation. Namely, whenever you do, you have a, a data, you compute uh, the function, you abstract the, the result, you get something which is below than starting from an approximated data and computing the approximated function. You don't have false alarms, so you are complete, uh, so you, uh, your program is not obscure, when uh, you have completeness. So when there is no imprecision between uh, computing in the abstract and computing in the concrete, approximating the abstract. Interestingly, you are complete uh, if and only if uh, the best correct there exists the best correct approximation, which we are in a Galois connection for the moment, and we will stay in the Galois connection till the end. And if and only if the best correct approximation is complete. That means that the completeness is a property of the abstraction and the concrete semantics. It's a relation between the program and the abstract domain, nothing else. Standard ways to achieve completeness is refining or simplifying domains. So given a domain, you can refine it to achieve completeness or simplifying it. So you can remove points or adding points to become more precise. That means uh, that your analysis, your program becomes less obscure for the analysis. You have incompleteness where we have an error, so when you compute uh, the abstraction and then you compute the function and then you extract the result, you get something which is above than uh, computing in the abstract. Completeness, uh, and you can uh, achieve this completeness by refining the input, so I add this point in such a way that this path will not exist anymore, or simplifying the output domain, I remove this point in such a way that I jump over. This uh, changes the observer, so the attacker is uh, refining or simplifying itself to achieve completeness. They are not changing the, the, the program, so this is the standard way in small code. I have one important piece of program, what to analyze the best way possible. Take this little example, this is an consider this as a concrete domain and uh, the alpha are these three points. This is an, abstra an abstraction of the concrete. This is not complete, why? Because look, if I take this point, I make the square of this point, the square function is my concrete, uh, is my program. If I make the square function of this, I jump here. While if I approximate uh, this point and then I go here and then the square function, I go up. 
What should I add to the domain in order to become complete? I should add exactly that point. Indeed, what we proved is that uh, an after domain is complete if it includes the, inverse, the maximal inverse image, which is somehow the weakest precondition of all the after points of the domain. This reminds an, a completeness uh, of whole logic uh, that uh, requires the weakest precondition as such. And whenever the input and output domains uh, is the same domain, in order to refine, you, fix, you make a fixed point over. So you need to iterate this until you close the domain with all these inverse images. And uh, for any domain A, you have um, a way for removing points and provides the closest one that is complete, or adding points, which is provide the closest one, which is complete, but contains, so it's more refinable. That's the story until uh, some years ago. So now we try to change things, and uh, let's change uh, not the abstraction. So we, don't, we do not twist the abstraction but we perform on the program. So we try to see how an abstraction performs on programs when they change. So we take a little programming language, we have uh, arithmetic expression, Boolean expressions, and programs. And for each of them, we have a completeness uh, condition that says there is no loss of precision if I compute in the abstract with respect to computing the concrete for uh, arithmetic, Booleans, and programs. Then I collect uh, the set of all arithmetic expressions, Boolean expressions, and programs for which this holds. And in particular, I try to see the class of programs which are complete for one given abstraction. The family of programs. What are the properties of this family? The first is that it's infinite, obviously. The identity program skip complete for any program, so for any abstraction, so I make a padding, I can continue filling up uh, the whole set. Not extensional, so it doesn't satisfy the property, the, the uh, hypothesis of Rice theorem. Namely, if you have a program which is complete and another one that behaves like that program, it may well happen that that is not complete. That's an example of obfuscation, because uh, for instance, in this case, uh, these two programs compute the same, but if I analyze the code with uh, the simple sign, in that case, uh, I'm unable to reconstruct the sign of the result because the sign loses the number. Just keep uh, sign. So these two sets, the set of all complete programs and this complement, the set of all incomplete programs, uh, cannot be an index set of partial recursive functions. It's non-trivial, this is more interesting. Namely, this set, the set of all programs which are complete for an abstraction, is the set of all programs if and only if the abstraction is the identity or is I don't know. Namely, whenever you have uh, an abstract domain which is more uh, refined than I don't know, so it contains more points, or lose some points because abstracts away some information, immediately there are programs which are incomplete for that abstraction. And the proofs, uh, even though is we cannot apply Rice theorem, looks pretty much like uh, the theorem. Basically relies upon the construction of a function which is computable and uh, is incomplete. Uh, the problem which is incomplete for that abstraction which is not uh, the obvious abstraction. So there is another one. That set uh, is extremely hard. So it's like, uh, it's like arithmetic somehow. Namely, whenever you want to generate a proof system or a method for enumerate uh, the set of complete programs for an abstraction, there is always one program that is function of that enumeration that will cannot be enumerated by that method. So exactly like um, in arithmetic. And this is done by making many-to-one reduction from the problem of non-termination to the set of completeness. So both uh, the set of complete programs and its complement are extremely hard, so are productive sets. In particular, proving completeness is harder than proving termination because both this class of programs which are complete and its complement both are productive sets. 
so they are not recursive enumerable sets. Okay, so it's really it's a tough problem. So if you go to obfuscation, th this was an attempt to try to have uh, a programming language-based proof of impossibility of obfuscation. It was failed, but we had this uh, interesting uh, corollary that says, well. Obfuscating is nothing else than moving. Uh, you have an attacker, which is your analysis, and you move from that family, from that class of programs for which the analysis is complete, into the class for which that analysis fails. And the obfuscating is, is doing the other way around. The point is that uh, you cannot make uh, a many-to-one reduction from one class to the other because that would imply that that class is recursive. And the previous theorem proves that it's productive, so it's not even recursive enumerable. So you cannot generate uh, a transformation that acts for any possible programs and works uh, from that class into its complement and vice versa. Inter the most interesting thing is, is that that transformation would pre should prefer should preserve the, the input-output uh, relation of the program. But that co would correspond exactly to proof termination. So once again, you cannot do that systematically. But this is okay. I mean, we, it's 40 years that we do static analysis and verification because there was a negative theorem in Rice, uh, 1952, that says it was impossible. So. so now the question goes back to the problem we had before. Can we prove that the program is inside here? Well, we will try to give a little proof, the simplest possible, just that it's a proof system that tries to under-approximate in a reasonable, computable way that set. Of course, cannot be a complete approximation because that a complete, uh, cannot be a full uh, computable enumeration of that set because that is not uh, recursive enumerable. Take this program. This is a straightforward loop. At this point, you are between uh, 0 and 9, and you query whether in the end you will be 0. And uh, yes, you'll be 0 in the end. You can prove it with intervals very easily, and that's the case of completeness. Do the same uh, trick with that program, and you get in the end that interval. Can you prove that in the end you are minus 1? No. You are incomplete. The analysis is incomplete, but what's going on there? Recall that we are simplifying as much as possible, so all the analyses are the best correct approximations. We don't use widening, and uh, the join in Galois connections, so we use Galois connections, is always uh, complete. So you will never get false alarms because you join elements, never. So what's wrong? The assignment is complete because uh, this is in intervals is a very straightforward shift. All the tests, the Boolean tests, are easily and exactly represented in intervals because this is just less than uh, equal zero or larger than uh, zero. So decrements uh, are complete, assignments is complete, join is always complete. So what's wrong? Uh, both should be complete. Something happened here is that. Uh, if you, if you look at the Boolean test, uh, the Boolean test is not complete. It's perfectly representable in the upstart domain, but it's not complete. That's the point. So the fact that your upstart domain represents intervals and uh, your Boolean test is an interval doesn't mean that the interval analysis is complete for that Boolean test at all. Look here, you have this set uh, and you get minus one, minus one in the end. If you approximate the same set with the interval, because you have a zero that, be, that is introduced by, by the convex uh, structure of intervals, you get a completely different result. This is included here, so you have an incompleteness case. So these two tests are incomplete. Can we build a, a, a proof system? Okay, we try to build the simplest possible proof system, it is this. If you want to check a while, then you need to have a complete Boolean test for your abstraction, both in positive and negative, because you want to be complete also in the exit of the while. The skip is always complete, composition is complete if the elements are complete. So the, the proof system uh, decomposes the code inductively on the syntax and tries to see whether 
one, uh, assign, one uh, sentence, one command is complete by propagating completeness inside. It is, of course, sound, and of course, it's not complete. But there is something that's missing there, which is assignment. So assignment is tricky. It seems that uh, an assignment uh, is always complete, but it's not. It is always complete for no relational domain, always. But whenever you have a relational domain, there are problems inside. So for instance, this is a straightforward uh, nullness analysis. This an the analysis of this program is complete. So if you analyze this code, you will have a complete analysis. We are doing analysis of analysis, not the analysis of the program. So that proof tree will be tell you nothing about uh, the nullness of that code. It simply tells you that the result of the nullness that you will do will not have fossil life. And this is works perfectly for um, no relational domain. So remember this, we are not making analysis, we are analyzing analysis. The assignment in general is not, um, is not complete. Is not, uh, this rule uh, is not sound. Namely, you cannot infer the sound, the, the completeness of the assignment by the, as the completeness of the expression in the upper domain. You cannot infer that. And the example is in octagons. It's a very interesting e example because there is a question mark inside. Namely, there is a, an open, for us, an open problem here. The addition is complete. This is not complete. Uh, so even if uh, the addition is complete as, a, as an expression, whenever you assign this to a variable, you can lose completeness. And the example is this. Uh, you, this is quite artificial example. We simply feed it with a particular set of uh, a state, uh, which has two uh, possible memories. And we get uh, that uh, there is uh, a result that is not included in what we would get from the octagon of this set. Computation of uh, the proof. But the question here, interesting question, is the following. That if we look at the only complete assignments for that specific analysis, they are precisely those that Antoine Minet identified as the only one that has the best correct approximation in the domain. So the question is, is it probably true that if you want to make, uh, to, to export uh, the rule um, of completeness for assignment, you need for the assignment a best correct imp approximation implementation in the domain? That's, th that's uh, an open question to us. It's uh, interesting that it happens exactly that way in this uh, upper domain. So, Let's go back to the analysis now, to the analysis of the analysis. So now we have this program. This program is, um, we want to see if the analysis of intervals works. So we have the full proof system. The analysis is interval, so it's not relational. So we will have no problems with the uh, assignment. And we try to play the game. And what's happened is that it fails because we have seen that uh, those uh, tests, those Boolean tests are not complete for for interval, but uh, the analysis was complete for that specific program. So it means that, of course, my proof system is unable to catch everything inside the, the class of completeness. Can we do it better? Can we refine the proof system in such a way that the proof system performs better on uh, and proves that this program will not, for this program, interval analysis will not write false alarms? Yes. This is, um, I don't want to say this cheating, but uh, I, will, I will try to bypass the problem by assuming the problem. We'll see how. Somehow you add the conditional rules to your proof system in such a way you say, well, I can assume completeness if something happened to the store that reached that point. So I need an analysis of the store of that point. It can be done dynamically, it can be done whatever. So in this case, uh, I need to assume that uh, something happens at this point, namely that uh, for all the store that will reach the, that point in the analysis, so in the computation, those conditions hold. And those conditions are precisely the condition of being complete for that test. This will be true for that uh, specific case. For, uh, 
intervals and octagons uh, and uh, in general for um, um, convex shapes uh, in uh, Rn, we are able to provide a theorem that uh, reduce these two conditions to simple projections over the space between the state and the condition. For instance, take this, uh, this is a specific case uh, of uh, a Boolean guard, which is a rectangle, R, and these are the states computed at that point. In this case, you don't have uh, incompleteness, so you are complete, because the projection of all these elements are is uh, inside uh, the intersection between uh, the condition and their interval envelopes. This is not the case here. So the error is precisely this little element, which is introduced by the fact that this point uh, is outside uh, the projection of uh, the others. We reduce this to a theorem and say this happens if and only if uh, you have this holds, that means that uh, whenever you, you project uh, over the generators of the, of the rectangle, which are exactly those that provide the, the, the Boolean test, uh, the elements in your set, uh, you get something which is included to those uh, that uh, were provided by the interval of the, of the set X. Exactly the same happens with, on, with octagon. It's a precisely the same theorem. So indeed, this theorem is generic for generic uh, convex uh, shapes uh, in Rn. So now we have uh, this, so we have uh, this hypothesis. If you are able to prove that the set here has some uh, structure, so you, you this is what I was saying, maybe you may think I'm, che I'm cheating because I'm using the hypothesis that I know the store at that point in order to force the proof system to conclude that, that the analysis is complete. But if you know that, uh, then uh, this is the set, uh, then uh, you are satisfy the proof uh, and the proof system say, for that uh, program under that conditions, uh, the proof, uh, the analysis will not write any false alarm. The interest application of this would be to use this proof system to infer these conditions to be added to the code in such a way that the code will have uh, dynamic checks that ensure that at runtime will never produce uh, false alarms. So you analyze the code, you assume uh, those to be true, and the analysis will be complete. This is another example. Here you have a complete, uh, here we, use, we do the same with octagons. And uh, you have, uh, you generate by this test uh, the two conditions. Um, this condition is satisfied, so this is nothing else at these points and intersected with this half uh, space. There is no holes. Here it is the same, this is the, 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 the inverse. Here you have uh, the opposite conditions because it's the exit of the Y, so the, the shape, is the, the space is half this uh, way, so it's a negative side and there is no holes in zero, and that will be complete, that the analysis of, in, of uh, octagons is complete for that program. But that program is the program that uh, produced the domain. Whenever uh, people in ENS thought about octagons, they thought about uh, a, a program that has cha that change uh, a data structure in such a way that increase uh, one and decrease the other. And if you think this is exactly the the octagon is exactly the invariant that you need to prove in the end a property of intervals. So in this case, the proof is, is complete. Uh, the proof uh, says that the analysis of octagon is complete for that program. It's not surprising indeed. This is not always the case uh, if you play the same trick and you try to get something less than one, so minus two or plus two. In this case, uh, you may add something here, so you, you generate uh, a set of points here that makes uh, your analysis uh, failing. Indeed, the, the proof system here is unable to exploit this for this set of uh, states. And the, proof and the proof system said that your analysis probably is not complete. Of course, uh, the proof system can, cannot enumerate the all complete cases. So what we have seen so far, and I'm closing, is that um, from the very beginning of 1979 up to, to, to the flower, 
we had many uses of completeness uh, in abstract interpretation, um, model checking, verification by simulation, obfuscation, and so on. What we try to do this year is try to use to use this property for as a archetypical property, so the basic property to check for a, an analysis, in order to see if an analysis performed completely in a complete way on a program. It, I want to check it in a simple way with the simple the simple possible type or proposition. What's going on after this? Of course, you may think of analyzing other aspects of the analysis, like its time, like uh, resource uh, usage, like uh, other forms of precision or bounding errors. So you can probably play the same game. And if you think uh, analysis of analysis is again an abstract interpretation, because what we have seen before is nothing else than a simple abstract interpretation over the code that performs in the same way. So what are the challenges? So proving that a program is uh, belong to the class of completeness of an abstraction is extremely difficult. But uh, you can decompose the problem, and uh, the only places you that you really have to care of uh, are the guards and the assignments, nothing else. So basically, if you have a big code, a big program that do many things, you only have to concentrate on these elements, because all the rest is uh, passed by the proof system in a very easy way. You can refine the proofs, uh, as we have seen, for numerical uh, um, convex uh, uh, abstract domains. And there are two question marks. Um, the first is the following. If the proof fails, is unable to prove completeness, can we use the, that proof for refining the abstraction? Because one of the problem in, uh, in um, refining abstract domains uh, that we introduced 1998 and published in 90 year 2000 is that uh, we don't have a, a kind of uh, CGAR procedure for doing it. We were doing for the old domain with respect to one function. That has been done a few years before CGAR has been introduced. The question is, if you don't consider partitions, but you consider generic uh, uh, Galois connections, which are far more rich than partitions, can you use that proof uh, as a driving guide for refining the abstraction? That's the first question. The second is, uh, is this nothing else than providing a kind of type for the analysis? There is a, a work by Patrick and Radix Zo in uh, Popol 2014 that types the analysis according to the way the abstract domain is built by simple domains with uh, properties with the operation for build com more complex domains. This is a different alternative way for, for um, typing analysis. And the other question is, uh, which is probably more interesting from the practical point of view, can we refactor the code in order to achieve completeness? I have a program, I have an analysis, it fails. There sh should be, there exists a, co a program that is equivalent for which uh, that analysis will perform. So instead of uh, refining the, the domain, try to modify my code in order to reach the precision. This is a question mark. I don't know if it would be. The talk I made is a mix of two things, uh, works I did on security and obfuscation with Neil Jones, Isabella, and Mila, and the stuff of completeness I made with Dato Professor Solodosso. That's it. Thank you.
So, so, wait, so you're saying that arithmetic would be a trivial abstraction? That would be more precise. Mm -hmm. The completeness I use is that is the complete of one step uh, of induction. Fixed point completeness is weaker because if you have, as you know, uh, if you have completeness in one step, you have complete the fixed point. But there are abstractions that are complete in the fixed point but not stepwise complete. Mm -hmm. Here we are just doing the stepwise completeness in the most uh, restrictive way. So Galois connections are no widening uh, and. Uh, because if you add all this stuff, uh, everything becomes uh, completely more, uh, more difficult. And the other point was, uh, you know, SATs are the ones that need to be affected by the idea of the Zilla. And they have a notion of completeness. And is it, uh, is it related to... I don't know. I have not seen My notion is the standard. Uh, <laughs> try to, to, to see if it's possible to reduce the class of completeness to incomplete and to have a proof based on programming language or recursive elements like uh, fixed point, finite fixed point, a little bit of disability and so on, of the impossibility theorem of Barak and others, of uh, impossibility of that um, virtual black box application. That means it's impossible to deliver only the input output of a program whenever you delete the program. Whenever you delete a program, you always deliver something more than its input output. We tried to reach that the proof and we didn't succeed. The only thing we so far we reached is that uh, you cannot uh, have a many to one reduction. So an, an algorithm that tries to, to take a program which is clear for an analysis and produce uh, systematically for all programs a program that is obscure. Then, uh, well, still open question how this uh, can be a real application. Yeah, and but, so, but part of the idea of this is you would like to be able to say, be able to prove that I have obfuscated a program. In other words, you have, you have proof techniques that I could use to show that my program is not complete for, for an amount. Yeah, the, 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 the key challenge in obfuscation is two. The first is that it's a compiler and it's not certified at all. So if it's in box, this is the problem of certifying compilers, but it's completely weird because uh, the technology of the compiler shouldn't be released because if you know the compiler, you can reverse it, and so you reverse all the obfuscation. The other side is to, to measure the strength of the obfuscation. So how strong is the obfuscation? So, because it's impossible, uh, virtual black box obfuscation, the only model we were able to see is uh, when we constrain the attacker into an analysis. And we constrain the attacker to be an abstract interpreter, can be on a finite domain, on an infinite domain, or whatever. That abstract interpreter, I try to make it the most uh, obscure as possible. That, for me, is, is measuring the strength of the obfuscation. It will, it will be always relative to that abstraction. I can always refine the abstraction and they have to re-obfuscate. Re the nice thing would be we succeeded for most of the elements in the recent Robert book to generate um, for each of the techniques uh, one abstraction and then a transformation that defeats that abstraction. That, but uh, this is mm, an experiment, not science. We need a new variant in this construction. We didn't find it yet. So having an abstraction, a generic abstraction, and derive the transformation that defeat that generic abstraction. Neil tried a lot with scheme and he produced really, really weird code by this specializing the interpreter. It's interesting because, for instance, there is one technique which is called flattening, that flatten the contour for graph. 
if you take the attacker and the absent interpreter that extract the control program, you discover that the only way to, to defeat that attacker is to force uh, the interpreter to have the program counter available. And this is exactly what they do in that company. They do nothing else than taking the program counter, make it in a very weird and bizarre function, in such a way that in order to understand where the program goes, you need to understand how that function works. And it is nothing else than making incomplete uh, the algorithm that extracts uh, the control program, which is a, a very simple after interpretation that uh, simple collect the actions instead of collecting the store of computation. So there are cases that show that this is possible, but the uh, general rule is still not there. Okay, so I suggest we take the rest of the discussion offline. Thank you very much. <laughs>